Okay, guys, this one will be a little bit longer, so you may want to either skip to one of the other chapters or just make sure that you have the time to listen to this one, okay? This is about educational learning theories. This is chapter three from your Brown book. Learning is the, the act of changing our behavior in one way or another. Learning can be multi-leveled. For example, learning how to drive a car entails psychomotor motor skills, actually learning how to physically drive the car, but it also involves laws. There may be lessons in how the car works in the first place. So you can put all those things together to learn how to drive a car. So it could be multi-level or it can be just simply rote memorization. The sky is blue, the grass is green. But learning means that we have changed something in ourselves or in our lives permanently. Behavior is sometimes called what's on the inside. There can be conditioned responses like Pav Pavlov's dogs. I'm sure you all know the, the story that Pavlov rang a bell every time he fed his dogs and eventually when he rang the bell even if he get, didn't have food out for the dogs, the dogs salivated, they ran to their dish, they went looking for the food because they had been conditioned that when A happens, I will do B always. In the hospital, we're conditioned to look at a patient and if, if we don't see them breathing, we, well, I say we start CPR, but we might just check to see what their status is. Anyway, we, if, if one thing happens, we always do another. You can desensitize someone who is repeatedly doing the same thing over and over and you don't want them to do that behavior. This is more like with children. We, we do this quite frequently with children. You want to change behavior. I don't want you to run into the street, Billy. I want you to uh, stay close to me. Every time you run into the street, I'm going to give you a spanking or take something away. So you have to repeat the same, um, the same scenario over and over in order to desensitize. You can use generalization where you teach someone when A happens or A altered, then you will always respond with the same thing. Um, if I throw the ball and I want you to catch it, it shouldn't matter if I throw to the left or to the right or straight ahead if I've conditioned you then when you see the ball leave my hand you will chase it as you get older you become more discriminatory in your learning meaning you can suddenly plan out your response to an activity so if I throw the ball now you can decide before you chase the ball before you go way across the field to the other side of the field to catch this ball you can stop and think, you know what, that ball is not in my area, someone else will catch the ball. Or that ball is so far away that by the time I chase that ball down, the game that we're playing will have moved on without me. You can discriminate. I will choose not to respond to that stimuli because I've learned enough in my life to know that it's not, uh, not worthwhile. And then there is spontaneous recovery. And that's when you, you know, you fail at something and you, you choose to try it again. You fell off the bicycle, you get back on. Um, there are people who simply give up or eventually you give up. And part of spontaneous learning is knowing when your task is futile and it's not worth your effort to continue to attempt it. This is one example of a, a basic learning model. You don't necessarily have to do anything for this learning to take place. It's just sort of a natural response to your environment. So the example here is that you smell something offensive and it makes you feel queasy. And then later on in your life you walk into a hospital and you happen to smell something that is offensive that makes you feel queasy. Eventually you will start associating that queasy feeling with hospitals. It's not really direct, but over a period of time and multiple exposures, this is what you get. 
operant conditioning is part of behavioral theory. It can be used to increase or decrease behavior. So we can make you do something or not do something. It's a matter of punishing you versus um, ignoring behavior. It's typically how parents teach children, at least very young children, how to stay out of danger or at least m mild, moderate behavior. Pretty soon a, a learner realizes that if I do what they want me to do, then bad things won't happen. So it's a way to escape or avoid punishment. This can be pretty simple and it can be really severe. Um, I Generally, when we think about how most of us have, have taught our children, it's been really basic. Don't run into the street. I'll spank you if you do. Pretty soon the kid doesn't want to get spanked, they don't run into the street. But I know someone who was um, tra sex trafficked as a young child. And as part of her conditioning when she was four, um, they put razor blades in her mouth. And every time she did something wrong or responded in a way they did not want her to, to respond, they put another razor blade in her mouth until at the age of four, she had five, six, seven, eight razor blades in her mouth. It will certainly make you not scream if that's the case. So this conditioning can be pretty simple and easy, it can be really severe. There's punishment caution. When you have children, one of the things that you're always told as a parent is to make sure you're punishing the behavior and not the child. Did you say to your child, I love you, I'm proud of you, I respect you, I'm not happy with your behavior. And separating between the two, the, the person and the behavior, is important. It's even important when you're working with adults. It's important to say to them, you are not bad, your behavior could use some uh, uh, altering. You know. Don't prolong punishment. It should be immediate and swift. Uh, and that goes the same way with, with giving a test or, or teaching your students. Uh, behavior should be modified immediately and you get more benefit from it. Research shows that the faster you develop or deliver punishment, the better. So you take a test. You really want the results pretty quickly, don't you? You want the fast turnaround. You want to know how you did on your test so you can you know, alter whatever you did wrong on the test. Actually, what you want is seriously been proven to be the best thing for you. Making you wait weeks and weeks for the results of your test has been shown, it's well documented, that you will not learn as much as if you get immediate response. Here is a quick little table from your book, and it talks about condition, operant conditioning, so why don't you take a look at that, read through it. Cognitive theory is more intrinsic, it's internal, it's internally motivated. It is not always um, motivated by society, but quite frequently it is. Probably the, the easiest thing to point out right now would be the easy example would be um, how people feel about gay marriage and same-sex couples have been fighting for the right to marry for decades and suddenly really in the last two or three years it's it's become sort of acceptable and even people who five years ago were very against this notion suddenly have come around quite a lot of people have suddenly come around well it's because they have realized that it is beneficial to them somehow, personally, whether it's that they get more clout or that they are just simply not ostracized, that they've, they've changed the way of their way of thinking and it is internalized. The reward in that case could simply be, as I said, not being ostracized, not being pushed to the outskirts, but it's a way of changing your behavior. It's usually internally motivated, meaning we're motivated for selfish reasons. And those selfish reasons could be altruistic. It may be selfish in a good way. In this case, it doesn't affect straight people, whether gay people get married for the most part. But 
it helps the straight person gain more acceptance in society. Cognitive learning, because it's so intrinsic, it's really individualized to each person and throughout our lifetime, it changes based on where we are, the place we are in our own life. There are several sub-theories that make up cognitive learning and we're going to talk about those next. The Gestalt perspective emphasizes the perception. It's been around for a really long time, this theory, and it's it's um, a way of looking at how we process information, how we change from one place in our lives and our thought process and our behavior to the next. The Gestalt perspective sees everyone as individuals and it recognizes that everyone will learn at a different pace and that we're motivated by different things. There are days when you will learn more and days when you'll learn less. There are days when you pay more attention and days when you don't. Sometimes it's because something interests you more and other times it's just because you're hungry or you're tired or you're having a bad day. So because of that, it recognizes that people learn at different speeds and in different ways and it's very individualized. The Gestalt theory also suggests that being simple and direct and basic is the best way to explain something to people. Now, this works really well at a real low level of education, so it works great for first and second graders. It works pretty well for your 100 level courses in college, but as theories become more complex, then we need learners to become more complex also. And pay more attention and, and assimilate more bits and pieces or at least be intrinsically motivated to go back and self-teach the parts that you may have missed. It recognizes that all learning, all adult learning is self-taught. Other people can't teach you anything. All a teacher can do is give you information and you can choose to assimilate it. There's no such thing as, as a teacher being able to crack open your head and pour knowledge in. I can give it to you, whether you accept it or not is completely up to you. And that's sort of the basis of the Gestalt theory. Information processing is part of all the learning theories and it is directly related to how you encountered information and what you did with it after you encountered it. We know it's been well established well researched that if you learn about something and then you never see it again you're gonna forget it or at least it won't be stored in such a way that it will be useful to you later on it's like learning a language use it or lose it if you will the more you use it the more ingrained it will become and the harder it is for you to lose that bit I could tell you how to use an oxygen administration device and the theory of it may be locked into your memory but if you never actually put a cannula or a mask on a patient, did you truly learn how to do it? And will you remember it? So is this information in a place in your brain that you can easily access and does it make more sense? Well, this varies from person to person. Everyone processes information differently. Men certainly process different than women. You process different at different ages. And so what works when you're younger doesn't necessarily work when you're older. We tried a lot of theories there's a lot of things that fly by lots of lots of new uh experiments if you will in education and uh and this is why it's because we're looking for new ways to encourage information processing i think i mentioned to you that when i was in my educational psychology class I was told that I could either be a guinea pig in a research project they were doing at UNLV or I could write a 20 page paper. So like everyone else I volunteered to be a research subject. I worked a 12 hour shift and then I went to UNLV dog ass tired and I told them I'm really tired I've been awake all night and they said that's great that's wonderful we can we can actually use this data that we're, you're going to give us. I thought, great I should have kept my mouth shut but that's the way it goes right. So they sit me down at the table, there's this wooden 
plate that's got these blocks on it. The blocks are of various height and each block has a number written at the top. And the guy uses the end of his pencil and he just starts tapping the blocks like a game of Simon Says. You know, three, seven, four, two. And I have to take my pencil and retap in the same order that he showed me. And then they, they were looking to see how many pieces of information you can string together and put in the short term memory and have it easily accessible. And it was pointed out the reason telephone numbers are never more than 10 digits long is because that's the easiest number for us to remember. Once you hit 11, it gets harder to remember. And it's true. It's really true. Same reason uh, that social security numbers are that length. Because after that, it's been proven, people just don't remember it as well. So just these little bits and pieces about the memory. We don't truly understand how the human brain works and how memory is connected, but the way uh, it was likened for me when I was learning about this in school was that it's like a spider web with lots of little spider webs connected. You start off in one spider web and there are lots of different spokes that peel off the wheel. And if you follow one, at some point you'll come to another hub. And when you get to that hub, you can choose to go left or right or forward or backward. You can go all different directions. But our neurons are all hooked together and processed. And because of that, we, we can try to create new neurons or create new pathways, uh, or we can solidify old ones. And that's how we remember. Here's Ganji's cognitive process. He says that you start at the bit at the bottom and work your way up, that the first thing you have to do is get someone's attention. And then you have to tell people what you expect of them. Later on, you present them with some type of information that you will later have them recall. And then you stimulate the brain in some way so that they put this information in some deep recessed place where it's easy to access later on. Then you make them respond and give it back to you then you assess how well they did and give them feedback. And it should come full circle where they can take your task and, and start from the beginning and basically teach it to someone else using the same method. Cognitive development most frequently refers to someone's physical age and their ability to learn, how mature their brain is. But that's not always the case. That's the majority of the time that's what we're referring to, but not always. It focuses on qualitative learning as opposed to quantitative learning. Qualitative meaning a nice, strong, healthy foundation to build more knowledge on. And so the, this cognitive development, if you were to draw it, would look like a pyramid, pyramid-shaped. It takes into account that someone has to be in a good mental state in order to be receptive to, to information. Next up is Piaget's cognitive development theories. According to Piaget, children, this is specifically for children, learn in four ways. They start with sensory motor, then uh, pre-operational, concrete, and finally formal. And you have to go through one stage before you get to the next. This is one of those bits and pieces that, uh, as parents, it's really handy to know this stuff when you have little children. But that aside, I have posted a video on the Piaget cognitive development. We'll see if it, it it's pretty funny. We'll see if it helps you uh, it, with your test. I'm also posting some other videos to help, um, you know, emphasize some of these concepts. So, as you can see, we have several different learning theories. We have Piaget's, which is self-guided learning. We have Vygotsky's, where we can be of slightly more assistance to uh, our learner. We know that, thanks to um, Palanzar, young children, really young children, like under the age of four, learn by themselves, and as they get older, they start learning more in groups. You can see this if you go to a daycare, you'll see a lot of kids off by themselves playing independently. They may play in small groups with one or two other children, but you will rarely ever see very young children playing in a group any larger than that. It's just the way they learn. It's, it's pretty well established. We know that some adults 
never really get past these initial stages of development. We don't know why. We think that there are a lot of different things that go on in their lives that cause that. Um, it's, it's like a, a, a repression or a retardation of that portion of their de development. And we know that um, the older someone gets, the more they will teach themselves until they get into a phase where, well, they're elderly, frankly, and their brain is not quite as, as functional as it used to be, in which case uh, they may sort of revert back. And then in that case, if you're working with a really elderly population, you might work in groups again, like you did with pretty young children, not tiny children, but the ten and the eight to ten year olds. Adults, though, generally speaking, through the majority of their life, do better when they have control of their learning and when they're in charge of it, which is something I've said over and over. So make sure when you create your learning um, for this class or for anything you do in the future that you keep those things in mind. So we know that there are social aspects of learning. Most of this is cultural, which implies by its very nature that different cultures socialize and therefore educate their populace and in a different way. This may explain why, for example, the United States is falling behind in things like math and science when other countries such as China are moving forward in these areas. They're socializing their children from a very young age that this is important, that this is mandatory learning, and they sort of don't don't give them any choice in this matter. They say, you will learn this end of subject. So in our culture, we've, we have a very patriarchal society that has, you know, really affected women more than men, at least white men, where we've told women, you should traditionally stay home, have children. Um, before the last two generations, girls were told not to get a job, just to find a husband. And so they were taught to emphasize their physical features, their social skills, more than gaining and garnering education. This is changing and it's getting better, but we still socialize our girls that way. And it's not that we don't socialize our boys too, we certainly do. We socialize our boys to think that they can't be good at reading. Well, it all matters what happens within your home and how children are socialized as to how they will progress later. Um, my son has above average math skills, but he is a better reader than he is a mathematician. That's probably because there are literally thousands of books in our house. It is something that was important to me and therefore, I have inadvertently passed that on to my child. So these are things that we all do, whether we mean to do it or not. And this isn't just actual physical, yeah, academic learning, if you will. It's really gender roles and how we treat one another, how men treat women, how women should expect to be treated, and where our places are in society. And it's certainly not just male and female. This crosses all lines, socioeconomic lines, racial lines. It's just that this socialization is important to take into consideration. And it's why we need different strategies to educate different populaces. So we need different strategies to educate um, children in a predominantly African American neighborhood with perhaps lower socioeconomic standing than the white affluent children's community. And you got to take all that into consideration and into account and know that uh, when you create an educational plan for any person, those things are imperative for you to take into account if you want your patient, your student, whoever, to learn at the highest possible level. This is just more of the same, so I'll leave this slide up for a few seconds so you can read it. There's been some really interesting research in how emotions or what part emotions play in your ability to respond to a situation. And that includes the process of learning. 
we know that when people are emotionally stressed, whether that means they're exceptionally happy, sad, frightened, any strong emotion, you can fill in the blank there, we know that when people are in that emotional state, the brain releases chemicals. Of course, it's different chemicals for different emotional states, but those chemicals may affect someone's ability to learn. When people are happy, they tend to learn things easier and, and retain a little bit more. When they are sad or unhappy or unhealthy, for example, frightened, in, in pain, then all those things will certainly negatively influence your ability to learn or a patient's ability to learn. So you, when you are trying to teach a patient how to utilize a piece of equipment before they go home, for example, so you're going to give them a nebulizer. You give them the nebulizer, but they're stressed out, they're afraid, they're usually worried about financial concerns. Are they going to pay for this hospital bill? Or so maybe that will get better in the future, but that's where it's been lately. Um, if it's a child that you're giving the nebulizer to, then you're talking to their parents, and their parents are, of course, concerned about their children. So there's pain and fear and worry all mixed in together. So you come in, you give them your spiel about the nebulizer, and then the nurse comes in and gives them their spiel about the four or five different medications that they have to take home. And then the physician comes in, gives them a spiel about follow-up appointments and dietary changes and all these other things. And then a week later, if you were to go back to these people and say, all right, tell us what we said to you before you left. Reply, I mean, give us, regurgitate it back to us. What did you hear? What did you learn? What did you see? They will remember about 20% of what you sent them home with. They will remember very little. Now they may actually remember the nebulizer better than some of the other stuff because they're gonna go home, open it up, and use it for the first time, hopefully, while they still have some fresh memory of your teaching demonstration. And for that, then we can go back to the other theories we've talked about, and you can see how they have sort of self-taught how to use the nebulizer. They've taught themselves. They've actually done it. Now they've improved their psychomotor skills with the nebulizer, so they may have a decent grasp on it. Now that doesn't mean that they're doing it correctly, and we all know where a nebulizer can go off the rails, but they will probably know how to turn it on and make it smoke. The medications are a little bit better than that only because the directions are usually written on the bottle and everybody knows that. So really your emotion and how it interacts with your learning and your ability to gather information and plop it in the back of your brain and actually have it in a form that you can utilize it's pretty well established. Now originally the cognitive development people didn't take any of this emotional stuff into consideration and so this new theory, the cognitive emotional perspective, is fairly recent and you can look on page 70, it's going to be on the far left column and you can see you know, this stuff in a little more detail. Social learning theory takes into account a lot of these other theories kind of all mixed together and it notes that the learner will just basically pick things up from their environment whether we want them to or not. With this one you should watch the uh, the Bobo doll experiments and also the Barbie doll experiments in the videos that I've posted. Social learning theory is a bit like lather, rinse, and repeat. You see something, you reproduce it yourself, you're, you internalize it, and then you reproduce it and then along the way you manage to um, extend that to someone else. So if a child grows up seeing their father hit their mother, it's a boy, then he will remember that when he gets older he's more likely to be an abuser. And you could say the same thing for the girl, she's more likely to be a victim. And eventually they will show their own children the same cycle. Psychodynamic learning goes back to Sigmund Freud's theories of the id, the ego, and the superego. The focus here is just to suggest that depending on which portion of the brain we are driven by, we will learn differently or at least retain information differently than if a different portion of our personality was in control.
here's a table this is on page I think it's 74 of your book and it's just a uh, examples of things that we do in order to protect our egos In 1943, Dr. Maslow had this theory that in order for you to become a complete person, be all you can be in the uh, army sense of the word, that you had to meet basic levels of, of need before you could add on to them. And that if you met all of these needs, eventually you would, I don't know, become wonderful. Now, the truth of the matter is, like next to nobody ever actually reaches this stage that in at least in the way that Maslow suggested because in his mind if we could all reach self-actualization then basically we would all sort of be like superhuman and and we would all be so enlightened that there wouldn't be any crime and there wouldn't be any poverty and that the world would just be amazing right so I mean I guess in a in a theory it's good um, but the reality is human beings just don't ever get to this place. But he said you had to meet your basic food, clothing, and shelter needs first, and then you had to be in a safe place so that you didn't have to expend your energy trying to protect yourself, that you needed to feel loved and, and, uh, and you needed to feel affection, uh, particularly from your parents, but also from the community. And then Ultimately, you had to attain a place where people esteemed you, they looked up to you, they wanted to be like you, they emulated you. And then ultimately, once you got there, then you would get to a place where you didn't care if anybody esteemed you, I guess. You would just be completely altruistic and giving of yourself. And so, yeah, theoretically it's good. But we know that, uh, number one, you don't have to have basic needs met. This, the physiological stuff there way at the bottom of the pyramid you don't have to have that met in order to learn and you don't have to have that met in order to move up on the food chain we have millions of examples of people who didn't have a place to live who didn't know where their next meal was coming from and yet they were still altruistic to others they were still able to learn so yeah it's just a theory and it really doesn't hold a lot of water but it's fun to talk about and other theories the humanistic theory which we'll get to next really based a whole lot of their theory on Maslow's theory so humanistic learning is where Maslow's theory comes back the humanists looked at not only Maslow but uh, there was another guy Rogers that they looked at and they went oh you know what their um, their research was pretty good hey you know what if we could make everybody into these superhuman people then wow we wouldn't even have to teach anybody anything we wouldn't have to have schools or teachers people would just sort of learn by virtue of being it's kind of silly in a lot of respects um, there are a couple of bits and pieces of it that work but for the most part the humanistic theory is uh, a lackluster we can make some generalizations in in part because each of these theories that we've talked about so far, Gestalt, Constructivism, Piaget's, the Freudian theories, even Maslow's hierarchies, to some extent they all have little bits and pieces of reality in there. I mean, it's not, I mean, the theory is a theory, but uh, if it's true, then it's a usable theory. And every one of these guys came up with something that if you, if you took a bit here and a bit there and you patch it all together, there's probably something useful in there. But we, we, we know that these theories didn't take in a lot of the neurochemistry involved in the brain, partly because a lot of these theories were old. I mean, they, they, this stuff came around in some cases 200 years ago. And so there's a lot more information we have now. And there's a lot of research that we can do now that we couldn't do then. A lot of cool brain research. And so, you know, the bottom line is... Uh, some of it's good, some of it's bad, and we learn about these theories so that we can all find our own path when we become teachers, so that we all figure out how best to teach our students in a positive way. Of these generalizations, we, we know that um, the brain works relatively similarly in most human beings in the same culture. 
So you can't necessarily expect people in China to respond the same way that we do to various things that get put in front of them. But, you know, there, there are a lot of similarities. That's presuming that people are developing in a normal sense. But the bottom line is, what we do know for sure is that learning is very complex. There are a lot of moving pieces, a lot of moving parts, a lot of things that are smashed together to make your individual learning happen. And you, you have to realize that, that it's like that with every student, with every patient, everyone that you attempt to educate. So using m various um, mediums, for example, is a way to get to as many learners as possible. So we'll watch videos, play games, um, draw pictures, make videos. There are different, different things you can do in order to uh, hope, hopefully make sure that everyone learns. Just a little more follow-up. We know that if you practice what you learn, it's more likely to stick and go into the portion of the brain that you can access at a later date. We know that if you are stressed, and by that I mean not just physically stressed, but um, sick, tired, hungry, afraid, there are a lot of different factors that will affect your learning. And we know that if you have any kind of neurological or brain issue, then it can certainly either cause learning to be more difficult for you, or in some cases completely eliminate one path to learning so that you now don't have that available to you anymore. And that means that when we teach, we have to find alternative ways to get information into people's heads. This is particularly important if you're working in a neurological unit. Motor learning is the ability to perform a task, like with your hands, for example, it could be baking a cake or uh, learning how to anti-suction somebody. There's a lot that has to go into learning that. You have to have a, the cognitive stage where you your brain understands how to do this, then you have to give instruction, you have to break it down into bits and pieces, show people how to put on the gloves, show them how to unwrap the catheter and keep it all sterile. And then providing guidance kind of goes in there. And, and I'll know that people will get this wrong. Nobody gets it right on the first try. The associative stage of motor learning is when you have the student reflect back to you and then finally demonstrate their learning skill. Again, you may have to correct things along the way, but you'll have them do it over and over each time, giving them less guidance. The autonomous stage is basically when students become proficient in something. And this is true in the hospital when you're teaching someone how to use their nebulizer or other medications, for example. Just make sure that you have gone through all the stages, that you've shown them, that you've corrected behavior, and that they can demonstrate it back to you. You've all been in my previous classes, so you have all seen pre-practice and practice in action. Pre-practice is when I would have you write your own scenarios for one another and practice it on each other and have you practice coming up with new and intriguing ways of doing things. And then practice was the actual competency at the end. This is, you know, the, the big one that made, made you all cry and whine. But now I hope you see that there was really a reason I, I did all those mean, awful things to you. I should take this moment to apologize for that. <laughs> Sorry. Feedback can be intrinsic or extrinsic. To skip to the second, extrinsic can really be documented well when you, as the student, as the learner, when you become proficient enough at a new task to actually teach it to someone else, then you have extrinsically documented your feedback. Intrinsically, that's really hard to, to measure. And the fact is, you learn and you feel good about it, but I think the easiest way to recognize from the outside if intrinsic feedback and intrinsic learning has truly taken place is in how secure your student feels in doing something. Some of you guys were really stressed out about doing competencies. Others of you kind of took it on the chin and knew that you'd be okay, that it wasn't going to let you fall completely through the cracks and that I was going to make sure that you left my class with a solid understanding, even if it wasn't perfect. Others of you didn't trust me enough to 
feel that way or perhaps you didn't trust yourself enough and I kept saying to I always say the same thing to students you know it you've learned it you know it just trust yourself just go into autopilot well that autopilot is your intrinsic learning it demonstrates to both you and I that you really learned it's intrinsic it's inside you but aside from whether you feel comfortable doing something or you're stressed out because you just feel like you didn't get it well, there's not a whole lot of other methods of documenting intrinsic feedback or learning. So what do we know so far? We know that learning is an active process, that it varies from individual to individual, and that motivation, whatever it is, is the key to learning. If you're not motivated, you won't learn. Certainly there are things that make it easier or harder for students to learn. And that can be the competence of your teacher, or it can just be some other emotional or physiologic thing that's within the student. There are certainly some things that we can do that make learning relatively permanent. Of course, everything is relative, right? If we organize our lesson or our lecture thoughtfully, then we're more likely to help students assimilate the information. If we make it more fun, more pleasurable, pace it not too fast, not too slow, we're more likely to have success. At this point, I will stop right here and apologize to you for this class because I really wanted to have this in person where we could interact with each other a lot and I was kind of bummed out to find out that I wasn't gonna have that opportunity with you because I think it would have been way more fun. But there you have it. Back to the slide. We can uh, practice under different circumstances and that helps. I mean, part of the reason for building the cube in the lobby was to give you lots of different uh, experiences in which to take care of a patient. Things that were uncomfortable and out of your, um, out of your realm of ordinary that would assure you had to actually learn something and learn it well and have it deeply ingrained in order to use it. I mean, we were, we were teaching you important stuff. And once you can demonstrate your learning skill to someone else, like don't just tell me you can use the nebulizer, show me you can use the nebulizer, then we can assume that the learning has been relatively permanent. That concludes this chapter. There are several videos that go with this chapter. I tried to find relatively short ones because there are so many of them. There's one, well, most every theory I found videos. There were some that were a lot of fun. When you watch the video, when you click on it, you'll see that there, there's usually a statement. I've written something underneath in the caption. Make sure you read that because I do want some feedback on some of this. So what I'm gonna do is set up a discussion board for this unit and have you put everything in there. Okay, thank you, and uh, you can move on to the videos or the next PowerPoint.